we want to launch into our pastor's pen summer sermon series by talking about daily devotion. Daily devotion. And so let me, if you'll allow me, to challenge you today to not listen to this word and to certainly not approach this passage with, with a perspective of familiarity. And I would encourage you to not even approach this passage with testimonial notches in your belt. But to approach God's word in humility that every day for the rest of my life, God's word has power and potency to bring life to my spirit, refreshing to my soul and purpose to my life. And so let's pray together. Lord, today as a congregation, we ask you to speak to our hearts to lead us and to guide us by your word and the power of your spirit. Lord, we consecrate and dedicate ourselves that we'll not just love you on the celebratory days, but Lord, that we choose to walk with you and to love you even in the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, I ask that you use me today to teach and to preach. Holy Spirit, give me the words to say, and I will do my utmost to say them. Lord, I put my hope and my trust in you and in your word, that it will do what it has always done. It will bring life change to us, and that it will cause us to live and not die. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. We've had a focus this year of being in and living in community together. So we've done many things to facilitate that, to carry out the Lord's command for us as a congregation to live in community. And so with those things in mind, I must bring a counterbalance to the idea and the concept of community. Community in and of itself is not virtuous. Community is a mechanism by which God, when it is right and when it is healthy, God will use community to bring supernatural life change for the better to you and to I. But we must remember this, that as we walk and travel in community together, as we walk through our individual lives together, we must have a connection, a grounding, and a rooting. We must have a wellspring within us that no man and no situation can take from us. There must be something in your life that you can draw from when times get hard. And here is one of the things that I have seen growing up. The bulk of my life in the church with my father being a pastor and my father-in-law being pastors, I have worked in and with pastors and pastoral ministry since I was a young teenager. And let me tell you something that I have observed in all humility. And that is simply this. Most people don't want to walk with God they want to go do what they want to do 99% of the time until something bad happens. And then they want to run to God and to God's house, beg and cry and scream out, God save me. And, and you need to hear this. There is nothing inherently wrong. We all have times, seasons, and circumstances where we get caught off guard. And let me tell you, anytime you run to God's house and run to God's altar, that's the best decision you can make. And so we don't want to condemn or belittle those that run to the altar, but we do want to call you higher, not from the life of a pauper and a beggar that you're constantly trying to beg God for a miracle. I believe that God's ultimate design is that he wants to raise up, call up, and grow up those from whether we be 40, 400, or 4, God wants to call us from a place of spiritual immaturity to a place of spiritual maturity where we 
we become the sons and the daughters, the inheritors and the princes and the priests and the kings of his world and his universe. And so you need to know something, that the moment you become born again, you have all of God's best in your hand and at your fingertips. But there is a process and a journey that we must go on. The Old Testament prophet describes it like this, sitting on the potter's wheel while he shapes and molds our life. And so here is something that I have learned. There is a almost boring, basic choice that every believer who has ever made a significant contribution to this world and to God's kingdom, they have made this choice and this decision that come what may, I will walk with God every single day. I believe a trap that we have fallen into in our splendor and in our polish, in our schedule, and even in our prosperity, I believe that the American church has fallen into the circumstance and practice of that we live rather than daily with the Lord, we live Sunday to Sunday. Because sometimes we can put on such a great show come Sunday that the prayer closet on Monday seems boring, dead, and lifeless, but I come to challenge that idea and that experience that the peak of God's uh, community for us might be on Sunday morning, but the power of living with him and serving with him happens daily. And a lot of times it happens in the dark and it happens in obscurity. Something potent starts to happen in your life when you choose, dedicate, and consecrate yourself that I will take time, make time, and spend time being with with my God, worshiping my God, praying to my God, and most importantly, one might argue, listening for my God to speak to me. I, the reason why I'm leaning on you today is not to condemn you or to condemn the practices of the church. No one loves Sunday more than me, but I have an obligation not just to inspire you and entertain you. I have an obligation to prepare you for the ups and the downs of life. And I have an obligation, we as a church have an obligation to model and to demonstrate to a lost, hurting, and dying world what it means and what it looks like to be a Christ follower, not just a Christ celebrator. And so we had that obligation and responsibility to not stay trapped in infanthood, but to grow up and to become all that God has intended, purposed, and called us to be. And so the reason that devotion has such great potency in our life is because it is a conscious intentional flexing of your choice muscle. Your great superpower as a human being is the will to choose. Let me let you in on a secret. God could if he wanted to, but he won't because he wants you to have his best. So God won't make you do it. And so we say, well, it's because he's a gentleman, and God is a gentleman, but let's just take that adjective off the table, and let's look at it this way. He is king and creator, and he has created for us opportunities to not just know him and see him, but to know the best of him, to see the best of him. And so let me challenge you a little bit. You may have seen God do great things, but you ain't seen nothing yet. I don't care what you've seen. How many of you think that maybe Moses thought he had seen the best when he stabbed his staff down at the edge of the Red Sea and the Red Sea split and they walked across on dry ground and as you're walking through the Red Sea, you turn around to look at the army that's chasing you and a fire tornado is tearing them up. I'd be like, well, I mean, that's kind of hard to beat. (laughs) You know. But fast forward the tape. And Moses walks up on a mountain by himself. 
And he's talking with God, and God's giving him command and instruction. And Moses says, God, I want to see you. And God looks and says, Moses, you pretty bad, but you can't handle all of me. So do you want to know how I know you ain't seen it all? You're alive. You're alive. You're here listening to me, and you're breathing. The last time I checked, none of you walked up on the mountain with a black beard and then come back down with a white one. Now, some of you may feel like me and Derry sometimes feel like, I woke up, and I had a bunch of hair, and then I woke up the next day, didn't have no hair. Derry said, I'm going to kick you. You still got lots of hair, George. Be quiet. Not just because of Moses, but the scripture teaches us that angels in heaven are flying laps around God's throne. And every time they make a lap, they yell out. No, they don't whisper it. Holy. <clears throat> He's holy. Some of the most magnificent, terrifying, complicated creatures you've ever seen in your life, your mind struggles to imagine what they look like. They are flying rap laps around the throne room, and every time they make a lap around God, they yell out in celebration and worship, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they're not worshiping and yelling out like that because they like to do it. And they're not doing that because they just saw the same thing they've been seeing since all of eternity. The reason they call out in worship is because every time they fly a lap, they see something they've never seen before. Let me challenge us. How silly are we that us in our flesh and the scripture teaches us that our lives are just like smoke and dust. And yet we think that because we've walked with God for 10, 12, 20, 30, 40 years, you have seen all that there is to see. And so we become lazy and lackadaisical in our pursuit and our devotion to the glorious king and creator of all the universe. Sometimes we need to poke ourselves a little bit, flip ourselves in the cheek and go, wake up, oh my soul, because there is a wonderful, amazing God who has great things waiting around the corner for me. Many of us, our testimonies, as they should be, are filled with what God has done, and that's good. But let me tell you something that I have learned is that when God does something in our life, many times he changes or overrides circumstances and facts. And that is when God is, I wish I had bigger arms. That's when God flexes his muscle and says, let me show you what I can do. Let me show you what I will do. It's one thing to know what God can do. It's another thing to know who he is. Many times we settle when we see the hand of God. But I wonder, I, I'm not going to wonder, I'm going to declare God is raising up a new generation. And I believe some of it is starting right here in Oklahoma City. That he's raising up a group of people that we won't be content or pacified with the hand of God. I believe the Holy Spirit through the word of God is stirring up a generation. He's lighting a fire within our spirit man. That ancient old fire that is shut up in our bones, that I can't be pacified, put off, that I won't be satisfied until I get into the face of God, until I see the beauty of Him, until I hear the voice of a thousand waterfalls and the voice of a still small whisper. I wonder, is there anybody in Oklahoma City listening to me today, whether you're 14 or 400, you will say, I'm tired of talking about what He has done in the past. I believe that it's not in His hand but it's in his face. There is something beautiful. There is something holy. There is something glorious that he has for me because I just don't want to know about him. I want to know him.